So glad you could join us. I'm Tamsin Fidel. And just like always, we've got a lot to talk about. But right now, we're going to kick things off in a big, big way. Ethan Hawke might be the busiest man in show business. So far during the pandemic, he's released a hit TV series, a new novel, and now a star-studded, first-of-its-kind virtual theatrical production of the iconic play Waiting for Godot. We talked about all that and a whole lot more. Samuel Beckett, what a day to be talking about it. And Waiting for Godot, I feel like we really understand what that is all about these days, especially when it comes to Broadway. Boy, isn't that true, you know? I mean, I I never even imagined that Broadway could be dark for a year. If you had told me that even two years ago, I would think, what are you talking, I mean, it went dark for like one night on September 11th. What would possibly do that? When the pandemic first began, you know, I have four kids and I thought it would be really, you know, we were sitting around the house doing nothing all the time or trying to figure out things to do together. Right, right. You know, so I had this bright idea that we'd light a fire and we'd sit around the fire and, and read Waiting for Godot. Um, oh, wow. And, and we did. And it, it felt like a new play to me in this context. I mean, just listening to people talk about not being able to remember whether it's Saturday or Wednesday or Tuesday. And it stopped being absurdist mm -hmm. in this kind of goofy, let's make a existential point way and started to be ferocious. Like it, it started to be, you know, like something tactile. You know, we've seen a lot of virtual productions over the past year, obviously, and I've been fascinated to see what what people did to you know be creative or to feel something in all this but what you have going on with Godot it's not a standard zoom camera but this is more a, a real theatrical experience meets film right you know it was one of those ideas that grew as we worked on it i've loved john legazamo for you know since i first moved to new york and i called him up and we started reading through the play and we we're like wow this is incredible like maybe this shouldn't be just a reading. What would happen? And there was something about talking to each other on Zoom that seemed to elevate. It was like, oh, you know, sometimes people set Hamlet on a spaceship or something and, and it right. you, you hear the play differently. Well, there was something about the loneliness and estrangement that the characters were feeling that seemed to be extremely alive. And then once we had it memorized and we're working on it, we started thinking it was really interesting. So we put better cameras in. And then the set designer, Derek McLean was like, let me build you guys a set. We got mailed a set to our apartment. And, and you know, I, I mean, listen to this. I had COVID, right? Oh, I, I had it. That. My wife and I had it and we had to build our set. I mean, I've never been so sick in my life and trying oh. to build this God set. Uh, the more time we put into it, the more we started to believe in it. I think it, to us, it, it felt like fighting for the theater. All right, let's talk about your writing, uh, Bright Ray of Darkness. It is on my Audible. I've been listening to it. This is uh, your first novel in 20 years. I, I love the fact that it has a fascinating look that most of us don't get to see of behind the scenes of, of a Broadway show, of how it's really put together. We see what happens afterwards, but we don't really see how it's all put together. So what gave you the idea to bring that to the world? I'm an old actor, but I'm still a young writer. You know, I, I haven't... I, I, I'm interested in writing and I'm, I'm a student of it. And I kind of felt, fell back on that first writing class rule of write what you know. Like if you, Don DeLillo or any fancy pants author out there would need to do, you know, 30 years of research about the theater to catch up with me. I mean, this is one area where I actually know something about it. And so that gives you an opportunity to perhaps offer something to the reader. The healing power of performance is something that's had incredible meaning in my life. And there's a lot of tabloid journalism about actors, mm -hmm. but there's not a very, there's not too many books you can find in the library that are fiction and a first account of the experience of what it means in a more substantive level to dedicate your life to performing. My name is Captain John Brown. John Brown, real life famous abolitionist leader. The show is incredible. It starts out with all of this is true. Most of it happened. For somebody that has not seen The Good Lord Bird, what does that mean? It means you have an unreliable narrator, you know? I mean, what we're, what, 
It's one of my favorite novels I've ever read by James McBride. And a lot of historical fiction pretends that it's the truth. And all of it has a point of view. We know the truth is so mysterious, you know? And the thing that I really love about McBride's writing is he owns the point of view. The whole story is being told by a 14 year old kid who is completely a bull artist, right. you know? <laughs> You've been reading the Bible. Not so much, Captain, but I've been thanking this golly way. If we can work with that, you stand for the Lord. The Lord will stand for you. What I love about it is because it deals so completely and uh, beautifully about race in America and some of the sins and crimes in the DNA of this country, by dealing with it with such a sense of humor, it, it kind of knocks you to the left and lets you listen. McBride tells the story of John Brown a little bit the way Richard Pryor or Chris Rock or Red Fox might, you know? It's, it's incendiary and mercurial and you don't know what's gonna come out of his mouth. And in this age, we're all so worried about saying the right thing and doing the right thing all the time. It's just like, it's a wave of honesty and love and silliness. And I hereby order you to get, get in his holy name. How do you summon John Brown's energy and fire with some of those speeches? Because they just go from here to here. I felt when I was playing that part that 30 years of acting was required. Every, playing Macbeth, Stoppard, Sam Shepard, all my experiences in the theater were required to play a character kind of of that quote unquote import. You know, I felt like I was playing a, it's like the first person who got to play King Lear or something. You know, I mean, sure. the challenge was so high and it also required everything I knew about making movies because it was not a play, it was a movie. So it was, there's something very theatrical about the good Lord bird. It's playful and wild and big and bold and works in big gestures and broad strokes and 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 yet it is cinema. This is Frederick Douglass. David digs real fast just to see him there. Uh, you know, he famously played Lafayette and Jefferson and Hamilton. Now Frederick Douglass, uh, talk real quick about his performance. I was blown away by him. Obviously, every time I see him, I, I, there's, he has that wild energy of a star, you know? Yeah. He was doing a play at the public and I went to see it and the play was incredible but my eye kept going like, oh my God, what if he played Frederick Douglass? And so, uh, wow. and so I went up to him afterwards and started courting him. Working alongside your daughter. Highlight of that? my life. Well, That's you know, great. watching kids grow up and watching them become themselves is really a powerful experience. I knew she was in trouble. She came to see me do the dress rehearsal of I was doing The Winner's Tale, Sam Mendes was directing it at BAM, and Rebecca Hall was in it. And Maya, I don't know how old she was, 11 or 12 or something, she watched the whole run through just hypnotized by Rebecca Hall, <laughs> you know? And when the run through was over, I said, listen, I'm gonna take you home now, we have a short break because we have to run through it again. You know, mm -hmm. she said, could I watch it again? Oh, <laughs> it's a, it's a three hour Shakespeare play, you, you know, and she was 12. And I thought, you really want to watch it again? She's like, could I? And I was like, oh, you're done. You're it's done. Over. <laughs>